Docker is a huge area of study and you can spend years studying it. But for the most part, you don't really need to know all of that just to get started. So in this video, I'm gonna show you like the 20% of Docker that I use 80% of the time. So the first thing I wanna bring up is downloading Docker images. Like this from tag here tells my Docker file to go and get this image wherever it happens to be. Usually it looks out on Docker Hub, but you can specify alternate repositories as well. But this is super critical, right? Downloading a Docker image, that means you're getting some Docker image from someone else and you gotta do like your due diligence and your homework so that you know what you're getting in there. I guess to say it another way is you wanna get Docker images from reliable sources to make sure that you're not look, downloading like malware, bots, um, spamming software, Bitcoin miners, all that kind of stuff. So get your Docker images from reliable sources. While we're on the subject there, you'll see a lot people using the latest tag. And I'm gonna recommend that you don't use the latest tag for this specific reason. Like let's say on Monday morning, I build this Docker image and we're off and running, right? But then on Tuesday, we have to rebuild this Docker image for another deploy or something. But in between those two times, Node has done a huge software release and they've got a new version out that's now tagged latest. So when we build that Docker image, we're not building it using the version of Docker that we tested against. And that can introduce problems and it can just lead to confusion when you're debugging that, trying to figure out why this thing that was all of a sudden working is now all of a sudden not working. So what you wanna do here is you want to tag that with a specific version of the Docker image that you're gonna use. Now there is an argument going around that even this can be faulty, right? So I could create an image called node and tag it with 14.15.0-alpine3.12, which just rolls right off the tongue. And then I could change that image, build a new image with that same tag and push that up. And that would be two different images that at one point were tagged the same, right? So that is a possible scenario you could encounter. And what I recommend doing there is just make sure that you have a consistent tagging strategy to avoid that. Because the alternative here is to use the, um, the image hash, which is just a huge long mangly number that can be, you know, you can get around that by just having a consistent tagging policy. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about here is your Docker file or your Docker container should run a single process. Like this one here, we're just running the command npm start, right? What I'm getting at here is you'll have certain scenarios sometimes where you think you need multiple processes running in a container. Uh, I can give you an example of, let's say I've got an Nginx application with a WSGI app running inside of that. And you gotta have both of those running in the container. So that leads to problems because the way that container runtimes work is they look to see that a single process is up and running when that process is not running it knows that the container is not behaving correctly and that container will uh, be killed. But whenever you get into this scenario of trying to keep multiple processes running, what you do is you have to create a shell script that then background launches those multiple processes. And so now when you're doing your, when uh, your container runtime is checking that Docker container, it's looking at the shell script and says, hey, shell script's running, we must be golden when in fact the processes that that shell script has launched may not be running. So that's the primary reason for one process for one container. What you'll wanna do in that scenario, if you have to have that, is each application ideally is gonna be running in its own container and then you can network those containers so that they're talking to each other within the Docker network or your container network. The next thing that's good for you to know is to avoid running your containers as root, right? Because when you run as root, your Docker container is running on the Docker host. And so you can open yourself up to some privilege escalation scenarios there. And you can avoid that by 
not running as a root user. So like I'm doing in this Docker file here, creating a user with the user ID of 1000. And then from here down, everything will be done as that user 1000. So when this container launches, it's running as that user, not as root. If we take a look at these copy commands here, each copy command creates a layer in the Docker image, right? And that's kind of works to your benefit because then as you build new Docker images, what the uh, container build program does is it looks at all of these layers and if it sees a layer that matches that, it's just going to reuse that layer. So let's say that we build this Docker image here and then I um, add another line after this copy command. Well, when I run that second build, it's going to look at all of this and go, wait a minute, I've already built an image with all of that. And so it will reuse that layer and then just start a new layer with the new command that I added there. Now, the reason I point that out is just to allow you to think about how you're building your Docker images and try to leverage some efficiency there. I'm not a huge fan personally of trying to minimize the number of layers in my Docker files just to minimize the number of layers. But I do want to think this through and try to reuse the layer caching wherever it makes sense for my environment. I want you to remember that your containers are ephemeral also. And that ties into the next thing here that we're going to talk about, that data should be written outside of the container. So what I mean by the container is ephemeral is that you should count on that container dying and being relaunched and never count on it to actually be there as a specific container. You know, you want to count on having a container there, but you don't really care which one. And where that gets you into trouble is if you launch a Docker container and then you go get shell access to it and you make changes inside of that container. Or if you're writing data inside of that container, well, when that container gets killed and a new one is launched, all of those changes are gone unless you've specified them here whenever you built a Docker image. Same thing with uh, writing data. If you've got like, let's say a database server, the key thing like to have in a database server is to save data, right? So you can't do that inside the container here. And you want to make sure that you're mounting a volume for that container to use as its database storage so that whenever that container dies and a new one takes its place, it also mounts that exact same data location and gets the data that the previous container had written. Build context is a really interesting concept that doesn't come into play a lot, but it's something I want you to be aware of. So what, here's what I mean by that. We've got this Docker file here, right? And at some point, we're going to build an image from this, which is going to trigger a Docker build process. And the first thing that happens is that creates a Docker context or a build context. And the build context takes everything that's in the same directory as this Docker file and puts it in the build environment. Now, the reason that's significant is whenever you look over at your folder structure over here, there may be all kinds of stuff that's just not relevant. And so you're taking all of these files, let's say you're working in a development environment and you've been working on this project for years and years and just got terabytes of test data that you've generated. So when you kick off a Docker build, that terabytes of data, if it's in the same directory, is gonna get copied into your build context. Now you may not ever use that in your Docker file here, so you think you're okay, but the fact that it gets copied into the build context is going to slow down your Docker build process, regardless of whether you use that or not. So in those scenarios, you want to be careful about where you're selecting or where you're putting your Docker file. And you can also specify the build context whenever you launch the Docker build command, if that's going to help make things easier for you. The next cool trick that you're going to want to leverage is multi-stage builds. And there's a particular reason for doing this. Like let's talk about a Node.js, um, a TypeScript app or a React app, something where you've got your source code, but then you have to do something with that source code before it's actually usable in your Docker file. So we need to take our TypeScript and we need to transpile it over to 
JavaScript, or we have some Go source code, we need to compile that into an executable. So all that has to happen while you're building your Docker file, but it creates a lot of stuff that's not necessary in your Docker file. For example, if you're building a Go application, you build that binary, all of the source code isn't necessary in your Docker file. So one of the things you can do to clean up your Docker file is use multi-stage builds. And I can show you right here what that looks like. So we're starting off right here, grabbing our trusty node image and then using the as here to call it builder. So that's the name of our image that we're building. And now I do all of the, the fancy building stuff here. I run my npm install. I run the npm run build, which transpiles my code. And now I've got another from statement here in my Docker file. But look at this. Again, I'm pulling the same tag as I did from up here. And then as we move down through this new Docker file down here, you can see I'm doing all the stuff I was doing before. I'm creating my user, creating a working directory. Now, when we get to those copy commands that we were looking at earlier, now they've got this additional tag that says from builder. So what that's going to do is whenever we copy this over, it's going to go look at this Docker image that we built here, grab the files that are specified here, and copy those into the new Docker file. And the end result here is this is the Docker file that we build. This intermediate Docker file here is built, it's used, and then it's just trashed after this process is complete. So the end result is that we don't have all of those intermediate files that aren't necessary for running our application, it allows us to keep our Docker images nice, small, tight, concise, and only filled with the good stuff that they need to run. One thing that you may wanna do is break up your files with different onto different lines for readability. Like if we look at this line two right here, it's getting a little bit long, right? So we could actually just break that up onto multiple lines by adding a new line there and then the backslash. Yeah, that's the backslash. Doesn't change the way that the build context works or that the Docker image is built, but it does make it a little bit more readable in certain scenarios for future you which you'll appreciate when you come across that scenario. We'll come back down to our command here and we can also have an entry point here, which is very similar. The difference between the two is your entry point always runs and then your command can provide supplemental arguments or overrides to that entry point. But that's way off topic from where I was going with this. The key thing is there's no such thing as a service in Docker. Uh, there's no init process and the reason that's important goes back to, like I was talking earlier, one Docker container, one process. Like let's say you have a scenario where you want to run multiple processes and you're like, well, I'll just, I'm gonna run Node.js and Postgres here and I'll just start Postgres as a service. Except you can't do that because in container land, there are no services. So FYI, just wanted you to know that. Just sharing information, man. When it comes to exposing ports, choose the traditional port, right? So what I mean by that is exposing a port makes it possible for things outside of your Docker container to talk to that Docker container over that specific port, right? And by using traditional ports, what I'm saying is if this were a Postgres container, use port 5432 or if it were MySQL, use port 3306. Don't fall into the habit of saying, of thinking that you're gonna be clever by running MySQL on port 13306. It just makes things confusing. It makes it a little easier to understand this whenever you run on traditional ports, like, hey, it's a MySQL container, I know 3306 is gonna be open. And then if that's a conflict on the host system where this is being run, then you can address that there. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. But first I wanna talk about the working directory here. So always prefer your working directory over a bunch of change directory type tags, right? So we could do, instead of doing a working directory here, we could do run cd dot dot whack app or something like that. And that can get confusing, right? Because then you, in order to evaluate what this statement is doing, you have to go back up here and look at any of the run commands to see if you've changed directories and where you're at. Or you can just set the work directory 
And now you know that from everything from this point down is gonna happen inside this app folder. So that's like the 20% of building Docker images that you're gonna use 80% of the time. The last thing I wanna show you is whenever it comes to running Docker containers. And this is actually really straightforward, or maybe not straightforward, but I'm gonna talk a whole lot less. So if you like that, be sure and click the like button down below. Whenever I run Docker containers, there's really only a few things that I do. Um, map a port, and I map that to whatever port is relevant to the host. You know, I could do, if we were running Postgres, I could do 5432 to port 5432. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, maybe port 5432 is not available on my host, or I need to reserve that for some future use case. I can change that up here when I execute the Docker container, and I don't have to worry about what port it was here when we built the Docker image. So now what this would do was it would map my local port on the host of 15432 to the exposed port 5432 in my Docker container. The other thing that's common to do is dash V mounting a volume again so that you can persist data outside of the container so you don't lose it. So I could mount dot whack app to um, whatever I needed to inside user lib data Postgres. I don't know. I just made that up. But just trying to illustrate the point that you can map that over. So now anything inside that container that gets written to user lib data Postgres is actually going to be written to the local app directory on my file system here. And then the last thing is just the name of your Docker image and your tag. And that's kind of it. When it comes to running containers, really, it's pretty rare for me to venture anywhere outside of this right here. Publish your ports, map your volumes, launch your image, you're off to the races. Hope that was helpful for you. If you get through that and you're starting to feel comfortable and want to go deeper with Docker, be sure and check out my full Docker one hour course. I think there's a lot more information in there that's going to be helpful for you. And um, I'll see you in the next video. Did I record? Oh, good. I did. That would have been a bummer. <laughs> and so what I'm trying to get at there is you'll have these, actually, can I say that without scratching my nose? <laughs>